This conference will now be recorded. Okay, well, I'll, it's 11.30. I'll call immediate order. And, uh, uh, Mr. Uh, Manager, do we have a quorum? <clears throat> Mr. Chairman, uh, I will read through the uh, roll call. Uh, I'll go through the committee and then, of course, the board members as well. Uh, Director sure. and President Williams? Here. Chairman Don Deere? Here. Alternate Gloria Gray? Here. Director Houston? Here. And Director Alvarez? Mr. Chairman, we do have a quorum. Very good. But I am free. Is there any public comment? Mr. Chairman, we have not received any uh, requests for public comment. Uh, I'm not exactly sure if we have any members of the public that are joining us today virtually, but if there is anybody that, that would like to speak under public comment, please let us know now. Seeing and hearing none. Are there any presentations? Mr. Chairman, we have no presentations for you today. All right, we'll go to the acting calendar. You have the minutes, December 22nd, special board meeting. That is correct, Mr. President. Uh, we do have the uh, minutes from our uh, special board meeting on December 22nd. Uh, they are there uh, within the board packet for your review. And uh, if there are any questions, please let me know. Are there any questions? None here. Yes, Director Williams. So I would uh, move the uh, minutes to go forward. All right, I concur. And so the, we'll move the minutes forward to the regular meeting for their approval. We'll go to item. Uh, what's the next item? Uh, five. <laughs> the annual board for reorganization. That is correct, uh, Mr. Chairman. Uh, the item before you is item 5B. Uh, this is a, a recommendation that the board elects the following uh, four board officers and the two appointed officers uh, at the January 24th, 2022 regular board meeting. So that of course will be next Monday, uh, but we did wanna bring this through the committee process. So I don't know if any uh, board members have any comments, uh, but this will be an action item that will be taken up on Monday. All right, uh, I'll start off with comments. I'd like to see us uh, continue the rotation. I think it's a good policy for the whole board. It's healthy to give everyone on the board an opportunity to experience the various offices. And of course, I know the Office of Immediate Past President is not listed, but uh, we, we use that title instead of this plain old director because it gives the person a little bit of status. And uh, so I would hope we continue that also at the next meeting. Other members? I would comments? concur with that. Thank you. Is there anybody else? Uh, any other comment? I agree with what you just said. I think we should continue the rotation. Okay. That, that would be, I would assume that Yours truly would become the president. Ta -da. Uh, Director Houston, the vice president. Director Alvarez, the treasurer. Uh, Director Gray, the secretary. And Director Williams, the immediate past president. That sounds good to me. And the same two appointed officers as we've had this year. Deputy treasurer and deputy secretary, right? Yes. Okay. We both, do, we both do a great job, probably, probably a better job than anybody else <laughs> could do. We did hear else? that. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, so we just pass it on to the full board for uh, their approval. Yes. We don't have to vote on it now, do we, uh, Mr. Chair? Uh, mm -hmm. Chairman Deere, be, because this is the committee and there's only two members of you on here, uh, this item would need to be moved uh, to the uh, action calendar on Monday's board meeting for a vote of the entire board. Uh, if okay. there is in fact, uh, a recommendation, we could take that and we could take that to the committee uh, if that's your preference. I would like to uh, 
move, uh, Director Williams, that we make the recommendation that I just described. I so move. All right. We'll, so we'll do my recommendation. Questions? Dr. Gray, did you have something? No, I didn't have uh, anything. I agree. Okay. We'll move it on as a full board with our recommendation. Um, I know I see at our committee for West Basin Census Redistricting. Yes, Mr. Chairman, uh, the item before you here is the establishment of an ad hoc committee for uh, West Basin Census Redistricting. Uh, obviously, I understand that the uh, board of directors are extremely busy, and I know we have a very busy meeting schedule. However, uh, because of the April 17th deadline for redistricting, uh, staff believes that it, it would be beneficial to have an ad hoc of two committee members uh, work on the redistricting with our consultants and meet with them uh, directly. Uh, and as such, uh, the recommendation here is that the board establish an ad hoc committee for matters regarding the West Basin Census redistricting and that the board appoint directors to the committee. Okay, yeah. I agree with this recommendation. I, I concur with the recommendation as and I would uh, to, uh, move that we appoint uh, Director Gray of Division 2 and Director Deer of Division 5 to the ad hoc committee. I'll second that recommendation uh, and make a comment that those two divisions seem to be the ones that are the most out of line in terms of population. One has the least, one has the most. So obviously it'll be the biggest that will have changes. Yes. We want to have a comment from all the board because we want to, we like to meet their concerns. Thank you, dear. I agree with the recommendation from the committee. Okay. Well, thank you. So we'll pass that on to the full board for approval. Any other All comments right. at this time? Okay. So that, that recommendation is passed on. We'll go to item D, sponsorship. Yes, thank you very much, Chairman Deere. Uh, the item before you is related to a fiscal year 2021-2022 district sponsorship request. Uh, the board did receive a request uh, for an upcoming event. It's the 2022 Virtual Spring Water Conference. Uh, as directed by the Board of Directors, uh, West Basin, when we receive these sponsorships, we do bring them uh, individually. Uh, to the, the, the committee and board for uh, specific consideration. And this is related to the Urban Water Institute uh, event. Uh, it will take place on February 16th through 17th. And I do believe that it has been moved to a virtual. I believe it was originally going to be a uh, in-person event, but it has been moved to a virtual event. Uh, and in the past, uh, West Basin has sponsored this event as a platinum sponsor uh, in the amount of $2,000. You can see here that uh, they do have three different options, a platinum, gold, and silver option. Uh, and obviously West Basin staff uh, would work on this with the Urban Water Institute if it is the direction that the uh, district sponsored this, this event. And as such, uh, West Basin staff does recommend that the board consider sponsoring the Urban Water Institute's 2022 virtual spring conference to be held Wednesday and Thursday, February 16th and 17th. And with that, Mr. Okay. Chairman, I'm happy to answer any questions. I have a question. Do we have $2,000 in the budget for this? We do. Uh, when, West, when West Basin's Board of Directors adopted the budget, there was funding specifically set aside for sponsorships. The discussion about memberships and sponsorships actually happened some, or after after the budget was adopted. So, so there are funds in the budget for this for this event. All right. Do we have any feel? Oh, I, I think absolutely, but I just need to know since it's going to be a virtual uh, event now, uh, what would be what would be our recommended amount of sponsorship? I think that uh, if you look at the uh, 
packet page uh, 56, I believe, uh, there is an outline of the, uh, the values and uh, work that the Urban Water Institute would do to promote West Basin Municipal Water District. You look at any of these three options, uh, the dollar amount isn't, uh, it's not too different. It's a, but on the lowest end, you're talking $1,000. On the highest end, it's $2,000. So, so there's a thousand dollars difference, uh, but there is, I think, great value, uh, especially when you talk about the Urban Water Institute. You know, I agree too. But uh, when we 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 had uh, set aside two thousand dollars in the past, that is correct. And, and that was for uh, in-person event, correct? That is correct. So should we uh, adjust now for uh, a virtual uh, event? And if so, what would be the proportional um, amount that we would uh, choose now? Or should we go so on the lowest the end? When you look at the silver sponsors, the thousand dollars, it still provides great value. The company logo would be listed on all promotional materials. So of course, uh, as the the event com gets uh, closer and nearer, you would see West Basin logo on all of those things. Uh, the company logo would be included within the program. So as you attend the, the event virtually, you would of course see West Basin. Uh, the priority position in conference uh, landing page. So there's uh, opportunities there, it includes a brief uh, West Basin uh, bio, a link to our website so people could actually uh, look up West Basin Municipal Water District, and of course our contact information. And of course, uh, you can see there below, it does include one conference registration. And I do know that West Basin staff, as well as the board, I believe, uh, uh, will be participating in this event. Well, so is there $2,000 set aside in the budget? I believe so, yes. So we can afford this. Are you recommending 2000 I, I, I would concur if you do, Dr. Williams. Yes. Okay, that gives us more registrations also. All right, thank you. Okay, that, that, that's, uh, any other comment from board members? If not, then we'll pass that on to the full board with that recommendation. <coughs> I couldn't hear that. Is that somebody online? I don't believe anybody was saying anything. I think I, I heard somebody coughing in the background. Okay, well, put that in the minutes. Somebody coughs. Mm -hmm. We'll go on now to the uh, item of what is that? item of E, uh, Community Outreach Events. That is correct, Mr. Chairman. Uh, the item 5E is a fiscal year 2021-2022 Community Outreach Event. It is the Achievable Foundation, It's Achievable Gala, uh, Director Houston has requested that the West Basin Municipal Water District Board of Directors uh, consider this sponsorship uh, in the amount of $1,500. Uh, this would obviously provide uh, opportunities for West Basin Municipal Water District uh, to advertise our logo and our promotional uh, materials within their uh, materials. There is a second item here. It's the El Segundo Education Foundation. It's a 2022 uh, Education Foundation Gala. Uh, this event would be held on May 13th of 2022, and uh, Director Houston has requested the consideration of a $2,500 sponsorship uh, that would grant West Basin an advertisement promos, promoting district awareness. Uh, all Both of these events uh, do meet our, our criteria uh, for public outreach sponsorships, uh, and of course, uh, West Basin staff's uh, recommendation is that the board consider sponsorship uh, requested by Director Houston for the Achievable Foundation, it's Achievable Gala event to be held on Saturday, March 19th, 2022, in the amount of $1,500, and that the board consider the sponsorship requested by Director Houston for the El Segundo Education Foundation's 2022 Ed Gala event to be held on Friday, May 13th, 2022, and that is in the amount of $2,500. I have a question. Did we do this last year for either one of those? Director Houston is present. I, I'm not exactly sure. I do recall us sponsoring and promoting 
uh, the uh, El Segundo Ed Foundation in the past. But of course, during COVID, a lot of these events went dormant last year. So it's possible that they didn't actually have an event last year. But uh, Director Houston, are you aware? Yeah, this is uh, Director Houston. So Achievable Foundation, we have supported them in the past, about maybe two years ago at an in-person event. And uh, the Achievable Foundation does actually provide services throughout a very large chunk of our service area, especially up toward uh, Culver City, Inglewood, and coming down into the north part of South Bay, just so you know. But yeah, we did uh, we did a sponsorship for them, I think, in 2019. Um, I don't remember if 2020 or not, but anyways. Uh, and then the Ed Foundation in El Segundo, um, we have supported them in different ways. But this year, I'm looking at their gala or their gala. Uh, that they plan to do in person in the late spring. So um, hopefully my colleagues will support both of these. Okay, well, I'll support them. Rick Williams? I concur. All right, so that's, that's a committee recommendation that we support both. We'll go on to the uh, item G, state penalty waiver requests. Yes, thank you very much, uh, Chairman Deere. Uh, the item before you is item 5F. It is an action item related to re resolution number 0122-1151, uh, the approval of the 2022 A refunding revenue bonds. And you do have this uh, item within your board packet. It begins on packet page 71. And Margaret, I believe you'll be leading this off. Yes, that is correct. Uh are we still in morning? Yes, good morning, directors. Uh, good morning, to, uh, Chairman Deere and members of the committee and board. Um, as EJ mentioned, this does start on page 71, um, and it uh, takes up a few pages here uh, within your committee packet. Um, but then uh, the item that we have you before you today is to approve the resolution 0122151 -1 for the approval of the 2022 refunding revenue bonds, as well as the associated cost of issuance. As reflected on table um, on the table on page 72, the financing transaction is strictly a refunding to recognize savings from the current refunding of the 2012 refunding revenue bonds. The refunded bonds will still maintain the final maturity of 2029 in August, and there's no new money for this transaction. Um, preliminary numbers have shown that we uh, may anticipate um, savings of about six million dollars or 18 percent but of course as we go to market those numbers may vary uh, depending upon how the market conditions are on the day of tra um, the transaction um, we are scheduled to do this transaction on the first week of february um, targeting uh, february 2nd and then it will close the following week um, in accordance with SB 450, staff is required to get a good faith estimate from our district's um, uh, municipal advisor, PFM, and they have done so, and that is also shown on page 72. Um, that uh, estimate shows that uh, this is uh, meets those requirements. The other thing that we wanted to disclose for you is the uh, cost of issuance costs, and it uh, is also outlined on page 143, and that information shares uh, those amounts that would be paid to those uh, financial uh, partners with us, including bond council, trustee, municipal advisor, credit rating, and other miscellaneous costs. The action before you today, as I mentioned, is to review the resolution and the associated budget bond documents. These documents have been reviewed by staff, by district council, the district's municipal advisor, trustee, bond council, as well as the underwriter selected for this transaction and their legal counsel. As a reminder, we selected Barclays to, uh, to serve as our underwriter for this transaction. So in order to review the uh, resolution and the associated document, I've invited Doug Brown here to provide us the information um, the information regarding the resolution starts on page two, I'm sorry, on page 75, um, and then all the related documents um, that he will speak to is on, uh, goes all the way through to, to page 275. And with that, I'll turn it over to Doug uh, to share on that, and then I can come back and read the recommendation. Uh, good morning, directors. The resolution before you would be the single action the board would take to authorize the refinancing to occur. 
It's going to approve the various documents, which I'll describe in a minute, and it's going to delegate to your board president and your general manager and certain other staff people the authority to cause the transaction to be completed. Um, these documents are quite similar to the documents you approved a couple of years ago in connection with the refinancing. Um, and I'll step through each section of the resolution to describe briefly the document. And if you do have any questions, feel free to ask as you go along. Section one authorizes the indenture of trust. That is the actual loan document. Um, it both describes the amount of bonds being sold ultimately will include the interest rate, but it also contains the financial covenants that you're agreeing to. These financial covenants are identical to the prior financial covenants that the district has entered into. So there's no proposed change to those financial covenants. Um, the second section of the resolution authorizes the preliminary official statement and authorizes the final official statement to be prepared once the bonds are sold. I think as you're aware, the official statement serves two purposes. Number one is a marketing document that Barclays will use to sell the bonds to potential customers, but it's also a federal securities law disclosure document. The district is obligated under federal securities laws to make sure that all material information with respect to the district is included and that the information is um, accurate and complete. As Margaret indicated, this document has been prepared by our firm but it's been reviewed by general counsel and various staff members. You as board members, you know, are expected to have, you know, looked at the document and made sure you satisfied yourself at the 50,000 foot level that the information is correct, though your staff is responsible for the actual detail that's included. Section three is the purchase contract with Barclays. Selling bonds is a little bit like buying a house. Um, the week of February 1st, um, you'll agree to a principal amount and an interest rate, and that will be locked in in this purchase contract. And then there will be about a week where the lawyers like myself run around and do all of the paperwork. So this purchase contract governs that one week period between the sale of the debt and the actual closing. So you're authorizing the general manager um, to sign the purchase contract, but you're putting restrictions uh, it cannot sell more than $30 million worth of bonds. The interest rate cannot exceed more than 2.5%. And the underwriting discount paid to Barclays is 0.4 of 1%. So as long as the sale meets those criteria, you know, the, the general manager is authorized to sign this purchase contract. <clears throat> Section 4 is the continuing disclosure certificate. As you probably remember, each time you do a financing, you have to agree to provide annual information to the market. That includes your audit, as well as some updated charts about water sales and the like. You already do this because you have a financings outstanding, but you are required to approve such an agreement each time you do financing. Section five authorizes not to exceed 30, amount, $30 million worth of bonds. Section six um, names U.S. Bank as the trustee for the debt, and they're the trustee for your other debt. So that's not a change. It's just a continuation of that role. Sections in seven and eight authorize the purchase of bond insurance uh, for the bonds or and a policy to be put in the reserve fund if it turns out to be financially advantageous. My understanding is that's not likely to be financially advantageous at this time. But that's a determination that gets made right before the sale. So you're delegating to your general manager on the advice of the financial advisor to purchase such bond insurance if it is cost effective. But as I said, it's not anticipated that it would be cost effective. And that's a function of the high rating the district has. If you were a lower rated district, it might make more sense to do that. Um, section nine of the resolution uh, uh, confirms that the good faith cost estimate that's required by the government code is included. Margaret already referred to that. Uh, that's included as Exhibit E, and that's a made available to the general public as required by statute. And then Section 10 is a general authorization. Again, like when you buy a house, there'll be a lot of certificates, notices, and the like that will need to be signed. So you are, the board is authorizing general manager president and other staff people to sign those miscellaneous documents that are necessary to close the transaction. 
So again, by approving this resolution, you're authorizing all of these documents and all of these actions. So happy to answer any questions that you might have. Are there any questions? So there's nothing out of the ordinary here. This is uh, more or less a standard procedure. That's correct. These right. documents are quite similar to the, the last transaction you did a couple of years ago. Okay, thank you. And, and uh, if I can just comment as well that um, the preliminary official statement that Doug referred to is, uh, you know, is the marketing document that's there. Uh, staff did update it since um, actually our May transaction um, just in 2021. Um, and it does reflect uh, certain, uh, you know, significant things that have occurred for the district, including the Hyperion spill, as well as any discussion around the standby charge. So uh, I do want to, to bring that to your attention that that information is um, you know, publicly made known, if you will, through our discussions here, but also will be made known within this document. Uh, I would say from our May transaction last year to this year, those are probably the two most significant um, items that have been updated within the official statement. Okay. Our staff continues to do an excellent job. We really appreciate our, our financial staff, Margaret and the company. Um, Thank you. Director so, Wheeler? So I, I would move this to uh, the board, full board. I can would you like me to read the recommendation? Right. Yes. Please let me. Uh, thank you. Uh, there are two, which is the first is that the board of directors approves, adopts, and authorizes the president to sign resolution 01221151, resolution of the West Basin Municipal Water District, authorizing the issuance of not to exceed $30 million refunding revenue bonds, series 2022 and approving the execution and delivery of certain documents in connection therewith and certain other matters. Recommendation number two, that the board approves the cost of issuance of $143,000 for the 2022A refunding revenue bonds. Okay, and uh, if the record still, I concur with Director Williams and move this forward to the board. Director, Dr. Houston, comments, or Director Gray, any comments? No? Okay, thank you very much. We'll go on to the next item. No, e. thank you. No, thank you. Thank you, Claire. Item G, late penalty waiver request. Yes, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, the item before you is agenda item 5G. Uh, it does begin on pack at page 276. Uh, as you'll recall, uh, West Basin adopts an annual rate uh, resolution each year. It does state that if a customer is delinquent in payment uh, for water delivered to their district and any related water delivery uh, charges, an additional charge uh, equal to 2% of such delinquency shall be assessed for each month or portion thereof. And uh, we did have a customer agency, uh, LA County Water uh, Works District 29, uh, they did receive their invoice uh, in December of 2021. Uh, the due date on that was, I believe, uh, January 10th. Uh, and I do believe that they did pay it uh, two days late. I think they paid it on uh, January 12th. It is worth noting uh, that they notified us, they called us to let us know that uh, due to the holidays and due to some COVID issues, uh, that the or the invoice would be paid late, so they did notify us that that we would be receiving uh, the payment, and they did request a, a waiver of this fee. Uh, in speaking with them, we did ask them to put this request uh, in writing, and you can see that uh, they they did put a letter together uh, for us. It's on packet page 278, uh, so it is there in your board packet. Uh, I do believe, and I know Margaret is, is still here in the virtual meeting, uh, that, that we have waived these on occasion in the past. Uh, and of course, LA County Water Works is requesting uh, that we do in fact waive it. Uh, as such, uh, the recommendation is that the board consider the request to waive the late penalty to assess LA County Water Works 29 in the amount of $20,894.44. And I, I guess I should also note the fiscal impact on this. We do not actually budget for any late fees. So this would actually have no impact on our uh, projected revenues. Uh, 
And with that, okay, Mr. I've Chairman. Read, I've read the letter and uh, I could concur with the request. How do you feel, Director Williams? I support that, yes. Okay, my other colleagues. Okay. Well, and if I can just comment, um, we did look in our uh, records and we've never seen um, a previous request for a waiver. So this is, uh, for at least for a very long time, we've never seen a request from the LA County. Um, so I just wanted to bring that to your attention. All right, thank you for the information. Anything else? All right, then we'll pass it on to the full board with a recommendation for waiver. Item six, information calendar. 6A, return to the office update, all report. Yes, Mr. Chairman, uh, as typical, uh, we, we do bring this item each month uh, as we track not just the uh, issues related to uh, LA County and the uh, Health Department, but of course, uh, state and federal uh, regulations when it comes to uh, return to the office in COVID. Uh, and for this report, we do have, uh, for an oral update, Michelle Grain, our Manager of Human Resources, uh, for this presentation. Thank you, EJ. Uh, good afternoon, Chairman Deere and members of the board. Um, as EJ mentioned, I am uh, giving my annual or stand uh, standing uh, report on uh, return to the office and any COVID updates that are out there. So as reported at the last finance and administration committee meeting that was on December the 20th, due to a rise in cases from the Omicron variant, the California Department of Public Health updated its masking guidance as of December 15th, 2021 wherein they were requiring masks to be worn in all indoor public settings, irrespective of your vaccination status for the next four weeks. Initially, that was for December 15th, 2021 through January 15th, 2022. And this was for jurisdictions where the local health department did not have an existing indoor mask mandate. However, this mandate um, has now been extended to mid-February. So that has been one change since our last meeting. As a reminder, the guidance um, that was applied here applies to all workplaces, regardless whether they serve the public or are open to the public. And masks may be removed if the workplace consists of a single employee or may be removed while an employee is alone in a closed office or room. Indoor public settings also, this mandate also dictated that indoor public settings includes local board and commission meetings. Now, since our last meeting, effective 12.01 um, a.m. on Thursday, January 6, the LA County Department of Public Health issued a mandate that no later than January 17th, 2022, which was this past Monday, employers are now required to provide their employees who work indoors and in close contact with other workers or the public with a um, requirement for them to wear a well-fitting medical grade mask, surgical mask, or a higher level resp respiratory um, respirator, I'm sorry, such as a N95 filtering face piece respirator or a KN95 at all times while indoors at the work at the work site or facility. Now, West Basin has always um, supplied their staff and continues to uh, supply their staff with KN95 masks for all employees. And this has been the case since uh, the um, mask mandates have been in place well over a year ago. This mandate further emphasizes that cloth masks are not to be worn in the work site. So we have advised our staff at an all hands meeting of this mandate and let them know that if they are coming into the office with a cloth face mask, that they must wear um, the KN95 mask that we provide versus that cloth mask. Further, um, West Basin's um, HR department continues to monitor and track COVID absences due to a number of reasons, whether the employee themselves have tested positive for COVID, whether the employee has notified us of exposure to someone who has tested positive for COVID, or if an employee is experiencing uh, COVID symptoms, or if the employee has otherwise been ordered or, or excuse me, mandated to quarantine. 
And so um, we have continuously been in contact with staff and staff have been advised that they must immediately notify the human resources department of any type of exposure of any kind, whether they're feeling symptoms or if they themselves have tested positive. Um, we have been tracking this information um, on a regular ongoing basis. As you know, we cannot, um, as an agency, divulge any individual names. But if there is anyone who tests positive for COVID and was in the work site either two days before testing positive or two days before experiencing symptoms, the Human Resources Department is required and obligated to notify any staff who were in the building on that date that they could have potentially been exposed to COVID. Um, since the onset of the um, Omicron variant, the Human Resources Department has had to provide notice um, on at least one occasion where staff, you know, needed to be advised that they may have been exposed. We have potentially another um, instance where we will have to advise. So we are looking at least two occasions now where we have had to advise individuals that on the premises um, that they may have been exposed. Again, this doesn't mean that those individuals have COVID or, you know, um, were in close contact with that individual. However, the Human Resources Department is obligated to provide said notice, not only to district employees and or directors who may have been in the building, but also to our contract employees. For example, our security guard um, contractor and um, our janitorial service contractor. So we're required to provide notice to all of those um, uh, individual settings. And at this point, does the, does, does the board have any questions for me regarding this update? Uh, Mr. Chair, I, I just have a quick question concerning uh, Suez. Are they uh, required to do this as well? So Suez would be required under any LA County department, because again, they fall within the LA County perimeters to provide all of these protocols that I have indicated here. And so, yes, they would be required to do so as well. And I know that they do have limited staff that are at um, Suez at this time, very limited staff. Um, at, I know, I believe they are still working a hybrid type schedule. I don't know how many specifically individuals who are coming into that workspace, but any requirements that I am under or obligations that the district is under in terms of providing notice and things of that nature, because Suez and where they're located at our treatment plant in El Segundo falls within the LA County perimeter, then they would and themselves also be obligated to provide uh, said notices and to provide uh, the uh, mass, medical grade mass to their employees who are on site. Thank you. You're welcome. Any other questions from board members? Yeah, this is <laughs> Director Houston. I have Go ahead. Questions, Michelle. Um, mm -hmm. What is the quarantine time now that we advise folks? So, <laughs> HR, <laughs> we've been in a, a it, it, it's, we have to actually now at this point keep a, a spreadsheet to have an understanding yeah. of you know who tests you know who comes into any of these uh, or falls under any of these circumstances because the quarantine or the time amount of time that we would normally advise someone that they have to stay off the premises really depends on a number of things either date of exposure date of experiencing symptoms or date that they tested positive and so typically. Um, if that is the case, it's five days. So if someone was simply exposed um, to COVID, mm -hmm. then in essence, they are advised to stay off the premises for at least five days. If they don't experience symptoms or they have a negative test, they can return to the office after five days. Now, if they start experiencing symptoms while in the office or they experience their experience experience symptoms at home they cannot come on the pres on the premises unless they have 
at least 24 hours of um, not experiencing symptoms any longer. And this does depend too on their vaccination status. But as you know, we do have a large majority or the majority of staff are vaccinated and boosted and or, mm -hmm. and or boosted. And so essentially all of this depends on you know when there was an onset of symptoms, when there was exposure, or when they themselves tested positive, but the standard requirement is at least a five-day quarantine from the from the office. And if they have tested positive for COVID, it would be ten and still experiencing symptoms, it would be ten days. Okay, very good. Um, and maybe you were going to say it or you didn't. I missed it. So. Right now, folks are coming in, um, is it a couple days a week? Is that how it's been working? Or maybe maybe I'm jumping ahead of your presentation. No, um, no, that's a fair question. We still have staff um, working a hybrid schedule at this point in time where they are reporting to the office two days a week. And so what we have done is ensured that within each department there's adequate coverage and that we're staggering those staff. So we try our best, say for example, there's staff who have back-to-back -back cubicles. We try to ensure that at least one of those individuals, you know, comes in on one day and then the other individual on another day. So we're staggering it as such where there's representation from each department in the building. However, on a very uh, limited uh, scale or basis so that there's no more than at least 50% of staff in the office on any given day. And again, that's to keep these numbers down. And you know, with um, the Omicron or the onset of the Omicron variant, we have seen a high increase in getting those phone calls of reporting of exposure and things of that nature. So there may be occasions where you're in the building and it looks like there's even less staff and that's there's a reason for that. And that's mm -hmm. because they staff have either been directed or ordered by human resources to quarantine for whatever given reason. But we are still working a, a hybrid schedule where staff are coming in two days a week currently. And Michelle, if I, if I could add one thing, uh, Director Houston, I did send out an email to the board uh, notifying them of, of, of kind of the process that we're in. We were considering actually expanding our in-office uh, work schedule uh, in the new year. Uh, we had worked that out with staff and, and we were ready to, to implement that. And because of the Omicron variant, and because of the high rate of exposure that we are seeing, what we did is we delayed that. And we'll play that a little bit by ear, but the idea is to, to delay it at least to the end of this month. We can get a better feel for, for how staff is doing and if we can implement that safely. Okay, very good. And I've seen that most of the cities in my area have sent out emails basically pushing everything toward the end of the month, like city halls are closed and certain things are you know, not as accessible, at least to the end of the month, looking for guidelines from the county. So um, I'm assuming Dr. Farrar will be continuing to update us um, as, the, as this resurgence may settle down a bit, it seems like, but uh, it's all to be determined, but basically toward the end of the month before we really know next steps, huh, Michelle? That is correct, and I have to say, uh, Director Houston, that things change rapidly and they change daily, mm -hmm. and so we're really doing our best to keep up with the different changes in, you know, LA County Department requirements or CDC requirements and or, you know, um, California, you know, Public Health Department requirements, and so they do change rapidly, but we are doing, um, I believe, a great job of, of keeping up with all those protocols and mandates and standards. Okay, very good, thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Mr. Chair, hi, this is Director Gray. I have a couple of questions. Can you hear me? Director Gray, Hello. go ahead. Oh, thanks. First of all, I just wanna acknowledge Michelle and her staff and the general manager because uh, you guys are doing a great job managing this whole pandemic issue for long, long time, and I really commend you because things do change quite frequently. But I do have a, question, a couple of questions. I'm not sure if I understood 
You said that if staff is experiencing symptoms at work or at home, they're required to quarantine for 24 hours. Did I hear you say that, Michelle? Uh, no. Well, if they're experiencing symptoms at work, they are told to leave work immediately. And if right. they're experiencing symptoms at home, whether home or at work, they're required to quarantine for five days and test after the, or actually, I'm, let me take that back. If you're experiencing symptoms, the CDC and the LA County Health Department requires you or, or recommends that you test immediately. And so they're required to stay home until they either test and give, let us know their test results. And, um, you know, and if someone is or has been home quarantining, what you may have heard earlier, Director Gray, is if they have been at home quarantining for some time because they were ill or experiencing symptoms, if they have if they are symptom free for a 24 hour period, then they can return. But but technically they would have been quarantining probably for five you know days or more prior to that. But they are automatically, automatically required to quarantine for five days or more if they are having symptoms themselves or experiencing, you know, experience those symptoms either at work or at home and, and to be tested. Okay, so if someone is experiencing symptoms at work, <clears throat> do you require them to be tested and proof of test when they come back to the office? Most definitely. So we are keeping confidential. Well, every employee and director at the district has a confidential medical record file that is kept in the in locked um, in a locked location in the uh, human resources department, and only human resources has access to those records. So any employee who tests, they are required to submit those test results to the human resources department. So all of those records are being number one requested reviewed and filed accordingly okay well that's fine I just um, I know there's there's a very small staff that supports West Basin and just want to make sure not that you're not doing what you should do to follow the guidelines but I wasn't sure what I heard from you but I what you're saying is that everyone has to have proof of a negative uh, test if in fact they have symptoms and certainly if they have COVID, they have to show proof of it. So that was my concern about it. And EJ, is there a report that you sent to the board that that obviously will not give the names of those who have staff who have tested positive for COVID? But do you give us in a report that shows that you have so many cases of COVID cases out of your staff? Yes, Director Gray, I did send out an email last week with an update because we had uh, we, we had enough staff members that were absent that I, I wanted to notify you. Uh, I can send that each week, but but I tend to, to focus in on, on just kind of the numbers and, and when it gets to a point where, where a notification is necessary. But if you'd like, I can do that each week and just give you the numbers. I think it's kind of important to let the board know as, as frequently as possible because things do change. We do have meetings and some meetings have we've requested to be in person or, or um, hybrid and that requires your staff to come in. I know you have limited staff, so I think it's wise that the board will know kind of how your staff is being affected by, uh, by the virus. So at this point, what percentage of your staff, if any, one is actually with COVID right now? Um, so with regard to employees who, and again, this, is, this does not mean that all of these individuals have COVID, but they've either been required to quarantine or stay at home because they have been exposed, they okay. are feeling or experiencing symptoms, or they themselves have tested positive. So as of today, we have approximately about seven employees who are in that status, or about so about 14% of staff. Is that number the highest you've had, or is that kind of in between, or can you give me an idea of what that means over the last few months or a year or so? Well, I've been, over the year, the numbers have been a lot less, um, but I would say 
that in terms of since the Omicron variant has been, um, you know, in existence, I would say since November, December of last year, that is not the highest number. We, it was as high as 24% of staff, I'm sorry, 25% of staff that were out either due to um, being exposed, experienced symptoms, or testing positive. So it was as high as 24%, approximately about um, 12 or so employees. And then we had to provide notice at that time of two individuals who were on the premises um, because two days prior to either experiencing symptoms or testing positive, they were on the district premises. So again, those notifications are only given if those individuals were on the premises two days prior. So this number is low in comparison to previous numbers. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, staff. You're welcome. That would conclude uh, my report. Thank you. Thank you very much for your work on this. I'm sure we'll be glad when it's all over. Not going to be soon, I'm afraid. All right, we'll go to item 6B. Just we'll hear about this. Mr. Chairman, uh, we are on agenda item 6B. That does begin, I believe, on packet page 280. Uh, and this is our information item on the fiscal year 2022-2023 uh, budget calendar and priorities. Uh, you will notice that obviously staff uh, receives direction from the board of directors and of course this committee specifically uh, in relation to the work that they've been doing in preparation of the adoption of a budget this year. I really do want to uh, commend staff as far as moving forward with a schedule that I think is uh, not just robust and uh, transparent, providing several opportunities for the board and stakeholders to really comment and, and be involved in our budgeting process. Uh, I, we've done this every year that I've been here at West Bay Senior School Water District. And this year, I would say there's even more of an opportunity. We're really gonna bring forth a lot of information uh, to this committee and to the board of directors moving forward. Uh, and so as part of this effort, we do have a, a presentation uh, does begin on packet page 282 and for this presentation we have margaret moja our executive manager of finance thank you uh ek for the introductions and yes uh the uh, packet page is 282 and happy to uh start this process with you in the new fiscal year uh uh preparation for fiscal year 22 23. <clears throat> so, as we begin the process to develop the fiscal year 22-23 budget, staff would like to begin to share an update of the anticipated budget schedule and staff input on the budget priorities to begin the dialogue with the board to understand if these items align with the board. This input allows staff to incorporate the priorities into the budget process and ensure that there is adequate funding and uh, funding to produce the work that is outlined. Next slide, please. I thought it was important for us just to begin with just reminding ourselves of the fact that why we are here, which is our mission statement, which is to provide a safe and reliable supply of high quality water to the communities we serve. So as a reminder, each time in our budget process, I will um, just share out what our mission statement is. So again, we can understand that in the context of what it is this dialogue is about. Let's move on to the next slide with uh, today's agenda. So today for uh, the agenda, we want to start with the budget considerations. What is it that we can uh, consider when we put the budget together? Uh, just give you a brief uh, recap, if you will, of understanding the district's budget. Um, then we will review the budget workshop schedule, um, the priorities that we staff has identified. Um, and then one of the things that we are trying to do is just really trying to uh, set the stage, if you will, of what the format will be. Uh, for each of our budget presentations, which is that we would start with the subject uh, of the uh, of the current topic that we're looking at, uh, re give a preview of what the upcoming budget workshop will be on, and then make sure that we're trying to address uh, questions that come from the previous workshops. As this is our first one, we will have probably no previous questions um, 
hopefully the input that we received to date is uh, starting to be involved um, in the process uh, and you'll see that here on these slides. And then of course, uh, throughout this budget process, uh, again, this is not for me to share information with you, but really I want a conversation with you. Make sure that we're getting the input that's there uh, so we understand what we need to do. So as we move on to the next slide, which is our budget considerations, uh, this really just at the high level focuses on um, the items that we have uh, and consider as we put together the budget. So for the first item, um, again, we want to uh, start the dialogue today, but throughout the budget process, we want to hear from you board, what are the board's priorities um, and the district's priorities uh, so that we can make sure that there's adequate funding uh, to support the completion of that activity. Again, we don't want to get to the end of the budget process and says we want to do you know, X study and we did not include those dollars there. We want to make sure that we have, again, sufficient funding to be able to do that. So if we hear something today with you, Hopefully in two months uh, when we come back to you with the numbers uh, specifically on, on those program budgets that you will start to see the funding associated with those activities. Um, also, uh, most importantly, is to really trying to understand the assumptions that are used. And so they've outlined here a number of you know, key assumptions, including water sales. Of course, we know Metropolitan Water District is also going through their budget uh, uh, processes uh, currently for their biannual budget. Uh, so we want to incorporate their uh, rates and charges. Uh, certainly those have uh, an impact to us. Some of them are just a pass through, but some of them certainly um, being mindful of what they have could make um, impacts on the decisions that we make. Of course, staffing is important for us. We wanna make sure we have adequate resources there to do the work that we've outlined. Uh, we want to make sure that the program expenses, more specifically the direct charges that we have with working with vendors that either provide us goods or services are, are incorporated into that process. Certainly a big discussion item for us is that discussion around capital budgets uh, and, and what those projects are uh, because it's making sure that we maintain our infrastructure, that integrity of our infrastructure and expand where appropriate um, and um, for us to continue on delivering uh, this local supply of water. And then of course the district does have a number of other, other revenues that we received and we'll have a discussion on that as well. And then all of that comes into to play to really make sure that the rates and charges that we're setting uh, do uh, start to target those debt reserve, uh, debt coverage calculations that we talk about and our cash reserve levels. Those financial metrics are certainly important to us as we you know, move into, you know, the financial market, going to sell bonds, or just as our customers look at us to know that we are a stable um, in, uh, environment here to be able to provide the services that we, uh, you know, state within our mission statement. So let, moving on to the next slide on page uh, uh, there, thank you, is the uh, revenues side of it. Um, now this is a, a, a snapshot, if you will, the current budget 21-22, but I think it's important for us to understand uh, the, uh, so the makeup, if you will, of what our revenues are. If you see here, the, the big uh, purple and green wedge, if you will, make up the revenues uh, from our water sales. The green being our potable water sales and the uh, purple being our recycled water sales. That represents nearly 90% of our budget. And so, you know, we will be spending some time in that area, really understanding the sales assumptions and the rates that uh, we can charge um, in those respective areas. But not, not to forget the other revenues that are there, but we wanted just to give you sort of magnitude of items, if you will, so that you understand sort of where the focus could be as we go through this budget process. Then we'll just go to, on to the next slide, which uh, gives us a focus in on the expenses. So typically we provide the expenses to you on a program basis, meaning what are we spending on our conservation efforts? What are we spending on our education, outreach, recycle operations? Uh, but, was, but at the request of the board, uh, there has been some requests for us to provide it more in a, um, an account basis or a, if you will, the, uh, the nature of the expense. Um, and so that's what we've done here. I know that slide's kind of small, so hopefully in your hard copy, you can see that there, uh, but really just again, to provide you context, if you will, on the materiality of some of these items that you see. So uh, once again, one of the most significant items there is our water purchases. So again, understanding those water sales assumptions, understanding 
the rate that is being charged to us is, you know, it's important for us to see where it is. And then we can see sort of where the next sort of large items are. So you can see that it's followed by, you know, our, our costs relating to our engineering and, um, and construction costs. It also uh, is our debt service. And so again, that is why we will spend some time um, with you to really understand the magnitude of those dollars. And then you can see there's just a sprinkling of other little items that while they are important for us to get our work done, these are items that from a, a magnitude or materiality standpoint uh, may not be significant, but, uh, but it also gives you a sense of sort of where, we're, where we intend to spend our dollars. So with that, I want to take you to the next slide, which is just really putting that information together. Uh, this information um, is just taking the information from the previous two pages. So you're taking your operating revenues, your $224 million, and then uh, combining both your operating and capital program expenditures to give you $270 million of expenditures. If you will, this is sort of effectively your, uh, your input of your, um, of your inflow of, of revenues and your outflow of expenditures, uh, from maybe from a cash basis, if you will, the money going in, the money coming out. Uh, but certainly um, as we uh, set our district's budget here, there are other items for consideration, such as all of those capital expenditures that aren't necessarily things that are being um, included um, specifically um, in this year's budget because there are other funding sources that we have for them. So for instance, uh, if you see down below, the capital expenditures represent about $59 million. Um, and we intend to get that from a few different sources. One of them is the PAYGO. That is the net revenues that we get um, when we set our budget each year. Again, to remind you, net revenue represents the difference between your operating revenues and your operating expenses. And that net, that change between the two is the difference that we then can use to invest back within the, um, into our infrastructure. Uh, we do also intend to get some funding from external um, partners, um, including grants and from our customers. Uh, the reason why they're not included in our revenues here is that it's a timing difference. While we fully intend to get these monies from these third parties, we may not get necessarily in the year, in this fiscal year, because a lot of times they need the project to be complete before we will get those fundings. So how will we fund those costs um, in the in-between time? This is where reserves and our use of our commercial paper program are a great benefit to us. This allows us to still maintain our cash flow, if you will, to make sure that those ex outgoing expenditures are being made, but that we will then at some later point get that. In the year that we're able to recognize those revenues, then you'll see an increase, if you will, in our net revenues. And this is really, uh, if you will, sort of an accounting treatment on how we need to account for it. But I wanted to really fully understand, um, have you understand, yes, there is revenues coming in and revenues coming out and it may look like we have a negative, but the, the reality is, is that the way that we're able to function is by using external funds, um, sources. The other way is that we will also have um, other debt that may come in. Um, as you know, we did, uh, were successful in getting a state revolving fund loan. Um, and that is uh, something that's being used towards our Carson phase two project. Um, and so as those costs are being incurred, we can then submit them into the state who will then start that sort of uh, clock, if you will, uh, to uh, repay on that loan. And the balance, if you will, is something that we can measure by using our commercial paper line. Now this commercial paper line is something that we can use in, in between time. And if we get another external funding source, we can then reimburse ourselves. But some of those uh, costs may be uh, maintained on that commercial paper line. And um, at some point may go on to a long-term debt. Uh, and again, that's a decision that we will work with the board on to understand that impact um, and see where it is. But those assets that would use that commercial paper line are items that would be um, longer and useful life. And so we want to make sure that those assets that are, you know, that, uh, that multiple generations are being um, uh, able to use the benefit of that, uh, we would then see revenues that would sync up, if you will, the benefit being used is with the revenue that we're generating in that particular year. The last thing I wanted to share with you is not just as much as the, uh, the cash flow, if you will, of money in and money out. It is really making sure that you understand 
our covenants here. Uh, you heard it mentioned in the previous action report about we make certain covenants um, within our bond documents and our legal debt service covenant is one of those. The 115 that you see here is our legal debt covenant. However, the district uh, does uh, our covenant or our coverage at something higher than that. Now this is at, um, at a response by looking at our rating reports that we get to when we go into market, but it also takes into consideration the uh, input that we receive from our municipal advisors and others that will say to us, you need to have a buffer um, in order to make sure that you don't get on in a place where you are not able to achieve, if you will, that debt covenant rate um, that you see there. Now, this is a good example this past year. This has been a very tough year for the district here with the impact of the Hyperion spill as well, as well as the drought messaging. Both of those items, if you will, have started to see us getting a coverage that's less than what we had budgeted for. That being said, the board made some good decisions previously to make sure that we are in a good financial position to weather through that typical time. And, and be able to reset ourselves in the new fiscal year. And so again, that coverage um, is an important factor for us as we look at all those items. So with that, I know I've shared a lot of information about just sort of the background relating to the budget, but I thought I'd take a pause here to see if there's any questions regarding uh, the initial slides here about what we consider when we put together the budget, what is our revenues or expenses or anything to do with our calculations. Mr. Chair, it's Director Houston. Sure, I just have a just a couple of questions so I can understand a couple of things here, uh, Margaret. And that is, so when you look at the the top number and then the second number, um, obviously Hyperion impacted us, and that's reflecting the numbers, right? Let me clarify that this number here represents the budget, um, and so these are not actual costs, but rather the budget. So. On a, on a budgetary basis, you would hear, you know, um, someone comments, yes, we, we're bringing in, uh, we're spending more than we're bringing in. And, the, and, the, and, and, and while that may be a true statement, we have strategized on, on why that is the case. You know, with our capital projects that represent about $59 million, if you take that out if, of that $270 million, you can see we were making or are making about $15 million a year. And that $15 million a year that we're making is being used towards that capital project. So it's it's a different way of looking at it. Um, and, and again, these numbers don't reflect that there. Now, if we take into consideration of now the actual cost, and I understand that um, I know I provided something to our interim general manager to share with you. Uh, there was a request for us to provide you uh, preliminary budget versus actual. Um, and, and we can certainly um, review that information um, but we also are planning to bring back uh, the updated, if you will, budget versus actual at our regular schedule, which is um, the next meeting in February. Uh, you'll see the update of that. But yes, we have been impacted uh, by the Hyperion. Um, and so, you know, when we take that into consideration, yes, there's been some costs that are being spent, if you will, on the operations side, but there may not have been costs that have been spent on the capital side. So from a cash flow perspective, I think we've been still able to contain, um, but it's just that our, our dollars are being spent differently than what we had originally anticipated. Hopefully that addresses okay. your question. No, no, it does, it does, you're right. Because um, this is purely the budget I think, versus what was actual. And then really fast, one other question. So the state revolving fund loan, was that just one loan or is this more than one loan in this number? So this particular loan here is for the, uh, uh, referred to as the Carson Phase Two. This is the uh, CEMF, the Customized Engineer and Microfiltration that we're doing over at the JMM Carson Regional Facility Plant. Uh, I know that we've also put a marker in for another loan um, relating to another one of our projects, which I believe we're making great progress on. Um, but uh, th this specifically is here, uh, as noted uh, at the time of this budget, was specifically for that Phase Two project. Okay, got it. Just one loan, one project. Okay. Yes. All right, that, that's all I have. Thank you. Anyone else? No, no, thank you. Okay, go on, please. 
All right, so if we can skip forward a couple slides on to the next slide, please. Thank you. So I um, wanted just to share just a high level of view of our calendar for the upcoming year. As EJ has already shared with you, we do intend to meet with the board um, and um, provide you more information um, and, and, and more times, if you will. Um, and the hope on that is really just to make sure that we're um, having this dialogue with you to make sure that we're um, incorporating some of the uh, important decisions that are, are needing to be made um, as we move into the fiscal year 22-23. Um, again, the hope is that we are providing you sort of bite-sized pieces, if you will, of information throughout uh, this time frame. So starting in February, all the way through April, which is, will be our busy month of sort of workshops, if you will. Um, and then in May, the hope is that we would just share the, uh, the preliminary information with you. Put it all together, you know, we've, we've shown you in different pieces, but let's put it all together, show you what the draft budget looks like, shows you, show you what the draft rates and charges are, See if there's any final comments that we need to address, and then really bring that item um, to uh, its conclusion uh, in June, where the board will uh, we, uh, have them consider, if you will, the adoption of the fiscal year 22-23 budget, as well as fiscal year 22-23 water rate resolution. So as we move on to the next slide, I just wanted to then go into a little bit more detail on what each um, what we intend to share at each of those budget workshops. So as it's shown on this page here, today here we are just to review the budget schedule and priorities. Um, again, the priorities are something that staff has internally uh, looked at and said, what is it that we intend to do, you know, um, as it relates to our, our programs, are we in person, are we not in person, what are we kind of contemplate? Um, but also, as I shared previously, but just to reiterate here, the format is really just to kind of give us a, um, a, a format in which, you know, hopefully most of them can be done in less than an hour so that we can really focus in on that topic. Focus in on what is it that is the key drivers around staffing or the key drivers around water sales. And then from there, be able to then provide a, uh, uh, just, uh, a quick highlight of what's coming up for the next workshop. And then finally, is there any questions that come from the previous workshop that we need to make sure to include um, at the, uh, at, you know, as a, as a decision point perhaps uh, for us going forward or something that we need to consider as we move forward in the process. So as we move on to the next page, this next page uh, provides a, a brief outline of what we intend to do here. Now, you'll notice here that it provides you not only a sort of a title of what we intend to discuss at that time, but also a specific date. So um, looking at uh, conference schedules and board schedules um, and trying to really um, focus in on a specific day, uh, essentially we're looking at Wednesdays to try to do uh, these workshops with you. So again, um, these have not been officially put on the calendar, but hopefully after today we can put these on the calendar have them marked for you so that you can uh, see what it is that we're going to discuss and um, be able to participate in them. So the first one coming up in February is intended to cover a couple things. One, we know there's been some discussion in the past as it relates to membership and sponsorships. We had some that even happened this fiscal year as it related to last, uh, you know, that was something that, that was already adopted. So to ensure that we uh, include the board's dialogue around what is the importance of each of these memberships and sponsorships, we wanted to start that process early so that we can get that feedback um, from you, uh, do that additional research if necessary, and then be able to uh, share that information out with you. Um, we also wanted just to make sure that we understand fully what the, is the purpose of each of these memberships or these uh, sponsorships and make sure that's there. The other portion of this, uh, First workshop here is to really focus in on the district uh, staff and labor assumptions, as well as just making sure you understand sort of where we are with our benefits. I think that's one of those things that periodically we will share with you, um, such as in February, we do plan to bring uh, to you your uh, biannual actual report around your other post-retirement benefits and show that again, we're once again in a, in a net asset position, which is a very good place to be. Um, but again, we wanted just to recap it for you so that you can see that the district is uh, being fiduciary responsible for these long-term liabilities um, and, and be able to showcase that on this particular uh, time. Um, so next uh, up is the next slide, which is to focus in on 
our workshop schedules uh, uh, for March. Now, these dates that are shown here are based off of uh, today's uh, assumed schedule. I know certainly as you uh, make those arrangements regarding um, who's going to be sitting on uh, what officers and then who are the sitting on what committees, things may change. But as of today, the way that our structure is, these are the dates. Uh, but the hope is, again, that we would have a dialogue at each of our committees on the respective program budgets. Um, and so you can see there at ENO, we would cover our recycled water operations and technical planning. At the PI committee, we would go over our public information education as well as our conservation um, budget. At our water policy and legislative, we would go over the water policy and resource management budget. And then finally, at the FNA committee, we would review um, all of the overhead related costs, including the administration, board services, building finance, and human resources. The opportunity for us to present this information to you is that we would provide like information, but really to help have you engage, if you will, with the responsible department, so that if there are any direct questions as it relates to why did you make this decision, can we spend more here, can we put more effort there, uh, those are the kind of conversations that I think is important for you and the department to hear together um, and make progress in those particular items. So it's a slight departure from what we've done in the past, but I believe that it will give us the opportunity to really dig deep into each of those program budgets. And again, we're hoping to show not only sort of at the department level, uh, I'm sorry, yeah, at the sort of, the, I'm sorry, the, uh, the program level, but really at the account level too, so that you can kind of see, hey, are we spending enough monies in one place or why are we spending so much over here? Um, and again, this is an indirect response, if you will, to the input that we received this past uh, budget season where you wanted, uh, the board wanted more information and we were able to provide. So let's move on to the next slide, which is the um, capital projects and funding workshop. Uh, this is one in which it may take a little more than an hour because I know that we have a list of, of projects that we would like to review with you. And so um, I know that you do, provide, uh, do receive updates at your ENO meetings. Uh, from our engineering department. And again, this gives a, uh, a dedicated time for us to really focus in on what those projects are. What's the current status of them and really understand you know, what those projects are on a go forward basis. What is the project purpose? What is the proposed timing? And what's the funding approach to them? Again, these are um, in direct response to the questions that have been asked by staff over the past year to really provide more information as it relates to our capital projects. And again, I think what's important to understand about project purpose is, you know, what, why are we doing this project? Is it for our safety, regulatory, contractual, or is it to do something different? And that, again, is the information we'll share with you. And again, hopefully uh, the input that we receive, you know, throughout the process will help us engage um, in those areas there. Because once we understand what the projects are and what, why we need them and why we need them now, then that really that funding question, that budget question really comes into consideration. Is that something I need to worry about today in fiscal year 22, 23? Or is that something we need to focus in on future years? Now let's go move on to the next slide, which refers to our water sales uh, workshop. Uh, again, uh, we intend to do this starting in April. Um, and again, really what we're trying to do here is really make sure that we understand the uh, estimates that are used for our water sales. As I mentioned to you, uh, our water sales, both from our recycled and our potable sales, along with it, their associated charges, are a, a fair, a significant portion of our budget. And we want to make sure that we really you know, understand what it is. We also have the benefit of the work that was just completed with our urban water management plan and the work that uh, uh, the water policy team continues to do with its customers to really understand sort of what are their thoughts around water management and how does that impact us? Are they doing more groundwater? And if so, that means less potable water sales to us. But if that means, you know, that they have to shut down something, we want to make sure that we're, you know, including that conversation into this uh, budget discussion. And so we will be working with the water policy team to share that information with you to understand not only our sales for fiscal year 22-23, but also our future sales assumptions. So then we get to the next slide, which really just puts those revenues and expenses together. Um, and it says, you know, we've talked to you a little bit about the water sales. 
um, and we wanted to see what those uh, items are. We want to take into consideration uh, the metropolitan water rate charges. By that point, I believe the schedule is that they would be adopting those rates or certainly um, in, a, in a fair enough along that we would have a good sense of what those numbers are. We would want to talk about those other revenues. Um, and then on the cost side is really putting all those numbers together and says, okay, we've given you capital, we've given you program, we've given you water sales. Let's put that all together and let's see sort of where we are from a inflow of revenues, outflow of costs, and see where we need to go. How do we need to set our rates in order to meet those financial metrics? As we move on to the next slide, uh, this really focuses on the long-range financial plan. We are at a critical juncture here to really fully understand um, the impact of water sales, uh, uh, understand sort of the district initiatives, and really want to make sure that we're um, outlining, if you will, what our assumptions are for our five-year forecast. I, I will just share with you, you know, within the official statement, for instance, that we just reviewed a few items ago, we do have to provide a five-year forecast. The, uh, the rating agencies and the customers want to see how are we doing, not just today, but for the next five years. Yes, certainly things can change over the five years, but we really want to make sure that they, there is some forethought, if you will, on the decisions that are being made today. Because again, setting rates today certainly have an impact for us on what it means for us in the future. If we make no decision to raise rates today, what does that mean? Do we have to increase them even more in the future years? Or maybe we don't need to. It all depends upon those long-term assumptions. And again, this workshop is intended to focus in on those items. Well, then finally, we get to the next slide, which is about the customer agency workshop. And while the customers are always invited to come to any of our public meetings to hear what's going on, and we will certainly share this uh, presentation with them so they have an idea of you know, what the, uh, the, the plan of action is uh, for us for fiscal year 22, 23, this particular workshop is solely focused in on highlighting um, those previous board discussions um, and letting them um, give an opportunity to share their input and comment, um, and if there's any direction that they have as it relates to our water sales um, assumptions, our rates, um, and anything to do with the budget. And again, we will go through what our priorities are, um, provide our, our proposed budget, our capital projects, and then our proposed rates and charges. Moving on to the next slide, uh, it focuses on the uh, the anticipated schedule that, again, accumulates all into this point, which is that at this point, we are looking at uh, providing you a draft in May and then, a, uh, and then a consideration in June. And again, the dates that are here are uh, what we anticipate this, the dates to be, but if those dates do change, we will certainly update the board um, um, in, in the process of, of the schedule here. So before I go on to the next section, which is about the budget priorities, again, gave you a lot of information there, but hopefully you see that the district staff is really interested in um, engaging with you more on, on, a, on a more granular level, if you will, on, on the assumptions that are being used. Um, and so we seek any feedback that you have uh, regarding um, the dates that are discussed here or what we're just planning to discuss at any of these workshops. Let me ask Director Houston or, uh, or Director Williams if they have any comments or questions. Well, I, I'm good with the dates here. Um, your schedule is my schedule, so not a problem. Very good. How about you, Director Houston? Yeah, I wanted to ask, so these will be, I guess, um, special board meetings. Is that how they'll be handled on those dates? Correct. Um, okay. Yes, I, you know, understanding that there's always a busy agenda at um, committee meetings um, outside of the March timeframe. Um, these are intended to be sort of standalone workshops. So again, that it's a more focused um, attention for us on each of these items. Um, I don't mm -hmm. believe a sort of a time has been established, so I can certainly work with uh, EJ um, and Julie to ensure sort of, is it 10 a.m.? Again, I want consistency for us all so that we can just mark them on our calendar and we're all ready to go. Um, I don't know if a morning or afternoon is more preference. Again, I'm at the discretion of the board here. Uh, but uh, again, um, the idea is that these would be the dates and then we would have a standing time. Oh, that's great. 
What I would like, um, well, first of all, since you've got these dates here, if staff could at least put these on the director's calendars just immediately as a whole, so we know that these are temporary, because then we're going to be changing officers and changing committees and, and there are going to be all these other things. So I would just like these to be already on the calendar so we have them. And of course, we get closer, we may have to adjust accordingly, uh, date and time. But I, I think that the first thing would be just put them on our calendar so we have them as a holding. Um, that would be great. I do like the idea of having numerous meetings to really dive into things. Um, and um, one other thought I have for feedback for you, because the next month you want to talk about um, the memberships and sponsorships, right, and the labor and benefit. Uh, which, by the way, I think we did a lot of good work this past fiscal year, really culling down that list a bit. Um, what I would like to see when you put that presentation together, Margaret and EJ, would be maybe you could show us the last fiscal year versus this fiscal year, where what memberships were there and, and all the, the outlay versus what we ended up on this fiscal year. Um, just so we can see a side-by-side -side comparison and or hear these dropped out and here's what's left. Um, again, I think we did a lot of good work, but it'd be nice to see, you know, how much we brought it down. So I'm just putting that out there now for that next time. Um, Absolutely. And then, and then lastly, I mean, I'm looking forward to trying to figure out how these dates come together. Um, and of course, I really think we've got to try our best if, as, as, as much as possible if, uh, you know, all the directors can be present when we're getting more toward those scheduling. But again, there's so much up in the air because of our committee structure. So uh, anyway, I thank you guys for this, but let's put it on the calendar now so we at least know that that very well could be a meeting date. And I'm not opposed to these meetings being on the same day as a committee, if it all works out. I'm not opposed to that, but you know, I think that we definitely need to just put a hold on it, okay? Thank you. Um, but thank you. Okay, very good. All right, okay, let's move on to yes, let's move on to now the uh, budget party. So if we can go forward a couple slides. So again, as I mentioned to you, uh, staff has made our first attempt of just sharing with you what uh, we and see as being um, our activity or action plan, if you will, for fiscal year 22-23. And, and, and how we intend to fund, if you will, the, our like items that you think are important, that these are the types of items that you will see funded, if you will, in the proposed budgets that will come forth um, in, in, April, um, sorry, in March. Um, and again, we want to uh, seek your input here. So if you have it today, we would love to hear it. Um, but if there are things that you want to share over the next you know, um, week or two, again, um, Oh, or throughout the process, um, again, we encourage you to be able to do that. Again, um, we value your input. We know that the direction really does come from the board, but we thought we would start the, the conversation with sharing with you what we anticipate is being some of those items that uh, are, are we feel are necessary, if you will, for the organization. Um, so as we move forward, um, I just wanted to let you know that um, th that this is sort of organized, if you will, by areas of focus. is isn't necessarily focused by department um, because in some cases there's cross-department support on, in, on these activities. Um, and so um, where they will end up, we can share certainly as we get through that budget process. Uh, oh, this budget, you know, this action item shows up in this budget. We will try to highlight that for you so that you can kind of reconcile between the two. Um, but again, the thought is, is that we will share you with sort of our areas of focus. So if we can go to the next slide, please. So again, these are items that we will see sort of being at the highest sort of district level. Um, we refer to it as the Office of the General Manager and Board Initiatives. Understand that, again, we are at a, uh, at a critical time here uh, with the discussion of our local water projects. Where are we in the overall mix? You know, we, as we know, we're going through a general manager recruitment. And there are other key areas of focus that we want to make sure that we understand um, from the items that you know impact us as an agency, but other things like the conversations that we've already started with DEI, with the diversity, equity, inclusion, or perhaps um, some discussion about how we are engaging with 
outside parties through either our membership or sponsorship involvement. And that's why, you know, we have that listed here um, as a separate item. So again, it's going through and updating our strategic plan. Our current plan, I believe, is from 2017. Um, I think there's been some comments that's there. And so I know that the board has made some significant decisions this past year and, um, and, and, and is setting the path forward to make some new uh, significant decisions. And so an update of our strategic plan is, is what we see is, uh, is important for that. Of course, with the, um, the, um, the general manager in place, you know, we do anticipate that there will be uh, board planning sessions of working with that general manager but also that general manager working with um, his management team here to make sure that they understand how do we all work together to make sure that we are meeting the needs of the district as we go. And then of course we understand uh, 2022 we have is an election year. We have three directors that will be up for election and making sure that we are incorporating associated costs relating to board member elections and installations associated with that. So if we can move to the next slide, actually, before I do that, let me go back. Um, maybe I'll just pause on each one and see if there's any input um, on these items. Um, if not, then I can certainly move on to the next slide. Just on. All right, moving on then. So this one I might refer to as organizational effectiveness. Um, again, these are things that as an organization, sort of, I'll say the internal infrastructure, what, is it, what are we doing here to make sure that we, as an organization, are supporting, if you will, the business of business here? Um, and so certainly uh, succession planning is an important topic for us. Um, you know, if you look at sort of our demographics that are here, we've got a great number of employees here, but we are starting to see some of our, um, an increase, if you will, in the number of retirees. We've seen a few in the last few years, and if we look ahead, we have a number of of individuals that are uh, uh, could be in a position to retire. I'm not saying they will, but could be in a position to retire. And, and we wanna make sure that we're adequately planning for that, um, making sure that there's that transfer of knowledge, the education that's needed, and that's some of the other stuff that you see here. What other essential employment development training do we need? There are some that is required by our holding our Aqua JPIA, for instance. Um, and with COVID, we haven't been able to do some of those items. and so. Uh, trying to get some of those um, items, um, you know, back in play, if you will. Uh, we also know that there's been an increase in sort of safety and risk management, and we just had a great discussion about return to office, but it's more than that. It's about us being out on the field. It's about us, you know, here in the building, making sure that we're able to really meet the needs of, of that. Now, again, we've got a great support, um, you know, in our, in our own team that, you know, manages it right there, but you know, what else can we do to fully support if you will? Very important things for the district, again, on safety and risk management. Uh, again, we're hoping to be back in person um, to, doing some things. Employee morale is an important thing for us. Uh, the district has had, you know, its annual employee recognition that we've had to put on hiatus for the last couple of years because we haven't been able to be in person to do that. Uh, now, there's certainly other ways we can do it, but we intend to be back in person to do those kind of things. Hopefully seeing the, you know, the, the back end, if you will, of this pandemic um, and, and being able to move forward with it. And then always, um, we know that's important to the board that we um, look at and see where we are involved with our local and our small businesses. Um, very important to our board to make sure that we're giving back, if you will, in the right place. Um, and so really analyzing our spend around that and trying to see where are we actually doing that. Sometimes it may not be at the prime level, maybe it's at the sub level. And so we can do a better job of providing that information to you. And so we'll do a little more analysis around those areas so that you can feel comfortable that we are really reaching to that community of small and local businesses. And never has it been more important, if you will, um, been recognized, if you will, in this last two years where, you know, small businesses um, and local businesses have really been impacted um, by um, the pandemic. And so again, I'll pause here to see if there's any questions um, on this slide. You know, this is Director Houston, Mr. Chair. Um, one thing I, I like that you all mentioned, the in-person employee spirit activity events, which of course is unfortunate the last two years, we've had not had that opportunity and I'm not really sure what 
staff has been able to do if they even got to do a virtual Zoom thing or whatever. But um, I would like us to look at if it's at all possible trying to do something um, in this fiscal year that's in person. If the you know regulators allow it at some point, maybe it would be outdoors. Uh, at the plant in the parking lot or something, but I just think that there's got to be a way that we should be able to do something this year as a group together um, with our employees for employees because that has just really been, uh, you know, killing me when I think about it because we, we do that every year and it's always so great and uh, we've not had that chance. So I'm just putting it out there now. I think that we should look at how we can build something in there in a safe manner, assuming uh, the world will let us do it before the end of the fiscal year. Um, I would really like to see that happen. And Director Houston, I, I apologize for interrupting, but I did want to just briefly comment. Uh, thank you for your for your direction. Uh, we continue to look at possibly doing uh, an in-person spirit event. Uh, we've been really concerned, I think, about having uh, the entire team together just because of the numbers but hopefully we get past this omicron variant and we can do something in person it'd be great uh, but i did want to give a special praise to our staff because while we have not had in-person spirit events uh, our human resources department we actually have an events team that helps put these things together we've done it all uh holiday party halloween party uh, it's all virtual, but it's amazing to see the creativity of our staff put together creative games and opportunities for us to interact. And so I definitely want to give uh, a big thank you to our HR team and the events team for, for doing that throughout the COVID uh, pandemic. So, so thank you to them. Chair, uh, dear, dear, Director Ray. Yes, sir. Yeah, um, EJ, I want to thank you for saying that because, you know, staff has continued to function as best as they can uh, since this pandemic, which has been almost two years, I believe. I, you know, I, I certainly understood what Director Houston has said about it would be nice to do in-person events with staff or whatever, but I err on the side of caution in terms of making sure that people are safe. Uh, and so I, I think that's what you have continued to do in terms of making sure your employees are safe, but making sure that they do have an opportunity to 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 have camaraderie together. So I just want to make that statement. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? All right, let's go on. All right, next slide, please. Thank you. So this is an important slide to us. This is, uh, you know, I will say sort of the one-off activities, if you will, that, that we see as being essential for us um, as we uh, move into fiscal year 2022 and how it really impacts us, not just today, but really guiding us into the future. So you see a number of studies here that you know, really help us to engage, if you will, on sort of what is our water management strategy, um, where do we need to address sort of critical um, and um, numbers, if you will, to really see how do we move forward, you know, as well as trying to maximize our revenues. So you can see here, you know, from anything from conducting um, a, uh, a a rate analysis, uh, uh, certainly we, we are very capable in house of doing that. But as you know, uh, we are in a position in the next few years to be negotiating with several of our refinery agreements. Um, and that uh, is beginning in 23, there's one in 24, another one in 25. And so really understanding that there's equity, if you will, amongst them and having a third party verification is super important uh, to staff so that we are in a stronger, I'll say negotiating position, if you will, with our other counterparts. As you know, we are, are, have an agreement uh, with uh, the city of Los Angeles with the MBR pilot study. Uh, we do continue to, uh, to consider that we will continue to participate in that particular program and certainly uh, depending upon where we end up on sort of that conversation, if you will, uh, could certainly have an impact um, to our operating budget uh, because these are costs that since it's not our facilities, uh, it's a it's a considered an operating cost to us and so would have a bottom line impact to us. 
Um, certainly, uh, we have uh, things already in play, like our emergency response plan. We want to make sure we're updating that and, and uh, you know, with the current sort of uh, status, if you will. Uh, as I mentioned to you, the regional water recycled water study is important to us. We know that there are many water agencies that are participating in a number of projects, and it's trying to understand what those projects are, how we, can we partner them, how do we support one another, really working on that concept of, you know, all of us under that one tent that, you know, you hear from the Metropolitan uh, General Manager. Um, and again, of course, all of this is trying to make sure that we understand sort of the water messaging. Again, with the drought messaging, with the board's action to move into a stage three allocation, really honing in on sort of what is this impact of water sales to us. Uh, I'll just preview that you're going to see something from Mary Ann where we did have a dip in sales in December. Now, I believe most of it had to do with the, that water, uh, the, that significant rainfall that we had um, in the later part of the month. But certainly, um, again, this is when the messaging is starting to get out there. Again, that drought is, is something that's with us and always will be with us. And how do we manage through it? Uh, and then, of course, we want to make sure we're pursuing funding opportunities for our conservation programs. But also, you know, on the other side of it is, you know, trying to understand if conservation is important to us to get out there, what is the funding that we really want to put behind it so that we can ensure that those needs are being met. And then the last is, is really um, something that um, came out of our water policy group that talked about providing a um, annual water supply and demand analysis report. So again, um, again, uh, the discussion around water is super important to us to, uh, and uh, from a budgetary standpoint to understand what are the decisions that are being made and how will that impact us into the future, because certainly that will have some long term um, impact to us. Again, I'll pause here to see if there's any questions regarding uh, the specific activities around just these various analyses and studies. Certainly not. Thank you. All right, then let's move on to the next slide, please. And this here really focuses in on water operations. Again, there's a number of really critical things that our operations team does. Um, specifically, you know, some of these are really focused in on our asset infrastructure, uh, making sure that we're able to um, have continuous service. And so doing condition assessments, if you will but also making sure that we're in compliance with our regulators. And so you'll see a number of items here that are really important to us from, you know, um, doing the uh, required engineering, Title 22 engineering report that is required for our permit. Uh, so there'll be, you know, associated costs related to those things to uh, making sure that we continue to maximize, if you will, our use of our facilities and um, identifying those customers so that we can make sure that the customers customers are really maximizing uh, the use of recycled water. Uh, again, um, this also helps us in the overall sort of water management discussion um, that you see there. Any questions on operations? If not, we can move on to the next slide. All right, let's move on to the next slide, which is our conservation um, program um, enhancements. Again, you know, the district has been very successful in its uh, conservation programs. And as identified here, you know, uh, conservation is a way of life and our staff is committed to ensure that we maximize the tools that we have for water use efficiency. Um, and, and by doing that, we do it by tailoring specifically to our needs of our, of our customers. Is it, uh, you know, the industrial, is it the residential, commercial that we need to really enhance there? And I know we've talked about targeted sort of uh, uh, efforts, if you will. So it's not a one size fits all, but what does this area need versus that area needs? And let's really focus in on those particular items. Um, and it also uh, makes it want to focus in on sort of making sure that we have the funding sources to be able to do these projects. Um, again, this is an interesting one. We're asking people to conserve water, which means that we'll have less water sales. So certainly getting some outside funding to be able to do that is important to us. But then the decision is, is that, you know, again, if, if conservation is something that was important to us, how much do we are we want to invest in our conservation programs to be able to do that? Again, you know, we can maybe get funding sources later on, but again, we want to continue this momentum of really supporting our conservation efforts. Um, and so again, we look at those four bullets there, really focuses in on making sure that we're targeting into uh, 
the uh, specific needs of our customers and really um, coming to them and meeting their needs where they need it. Um, and with that, I'll pause to see if there's any questions or comments. I know I've got EJ here and can speak certainly better than I on conservation efforts. Now this is a uh, board member Houston. I just want to think ahead about this one too, because I think we do a lot of obviously really good work on conservation, but I also, and I know that we've been working hard to sort of diversify that work. And yet I think some of it too could be, you know, that is so like, well, we've been doing this forever, you know, let's just keep it going. So what I would like to see when we get to that, a workshop is yes we see the work that we're doing with the rain barrels and we have the art contest and we have all these things but we need to look and see you know not only what is that costing but what is the, you know, the return on that investment if you will because you know i know that we've also been really pushing hard on one of the best ways to save water of course is take out grass uh, replace that turf and of course that's through metropolitan and we add in money to it so that's going to be something we will likely of course continue but then what about the cisterns you know do we give out more rain barrels do we give out less rain barrels i think we really have to take a step back and then see where because i right now you know we do have a lot of different programs i get it there's a lot to manage um but i'd like to see us think about are some of these kind of hitting their end point or we tweak them you know, do more of this and less of that. And then lastly, and I'm glad you have it on here, the bullet point about looking at those grant opportunities, because maybe, you know, that's an area where we could get funding for some new programming, or if we have something successful, we could pitch it and get funding for it. So that way we're not on our own in this. So just thinking ahead, I'd like us to really have a big evaluation of our conservation programs. Um, so that way we can consolidate and utilize it the best way with our staff. It's just a, it's just a thought. Um, I do think you guys have been doing a great job. It's really diverse, as I said, but then it seems like, okay, is this what we just keep doing because we always have, or do we, you know, readjust some things? Um, so, I'm, and I'm very open-minded to this, but I think that uh, it's a great opportunity for us to do that. Cause what I'd like us to see too, is to be a leader in this area. So thank you very much, Margaret. Making some notes, thank you. All right, well then let's go on to the next slide, please. This really focuses in on our education and our outreach efforts. Um, again, both of these efforts um, increase our awareness of a variety of topics, um, from drought messaging to the status of our current projects, and even our acknowledgement of our 75th anniversary um, you know, Amy and her team has already shared you an outline of some of the activities that they have planned for uh, the upcoming year, um, already starting and going throughout the year. Um, and so we want to make sure that you understand that there, you know, that those efforts, you know, turn into dollars to make sure that we can really uh, communicate again the benefit of, of what West Basin does within this region here. Um, also, um, as noted on that last bullet there, it talks about us uh, looking to resume in-person education at our ECL Water Education Center. So again, I know we've been in a position where are we virtual, are we hybrid, are we you know, back in person? So we do anticipate that uh, we will be back in person. So um, again, we would adjust dollars appropriately to reflect you know, the needs of us you know, doing the school tours or other tours that you know, may have costs associated with that. And then finally, I'll just draw your attention to the middle bullet there, which is we want to uh, increase our media um, relations practices within the region to really uh, understand, you know, or showcase, if you will, where West Basin is and how we are, uh, you know, uh, situated, if you will. Please hear about the works that we do um, about around recycled water or conservation, um, and so really uh, working with our uh, media relations team and others to make that happen. And again, I'll pause here for any comments. All right, hearing none, then I'll move on to the next slide. On the next 
slide here um, is again our focus on capital projects. Uh, the first two bullets you see there uh, really represent two of our our new infrastructure projects that are currently underway. Uh, the first one being our um, expansion I referred to, um, the um, I refer to it as the Carson Phase Two, but you see it here as the uh, custom engineered microfiltration at the JMMCRWRP uh, facility, um, and that uh, allows us to increase our our, our sales uh, to the, uh, the user there, which would be Marathon. Um, then the second bullet there really focuses on our uh, uh, lateral that we're building out to uh, reach over to the Palos Verdes um, area. Um, again, also currently underway, and so we again are looking to expand on that. But the third bullet really focuses in on the r, &R projects. Again, um, we have a great history here of 25 plus years, um, and, and we do have uh, a need to be able to meet those needs of our, our, of our customers um, by making sure that we're maintaining our facilities, that integrity of our facilities. And we're going to do so by looking at what are those particular r, &R projects that we need to do? Um, is it required from a contractual standpoint, um, from a compliance or safety um, reliability need? And again, um, we'll provide more information. I know some information is already being shared after e l meetings. Um, and so again, we will just be focused in on those particular ones. And then the last bullet there, um, again, there was some discussion at the recent e &O meeting about the um, board's direction regarding the uh, Donald L. Deere headquarters building and where does that sort of reside and what are we going to do? Is there current needs for us, you know, that um, as we uh, look for other opportunities that we need to um, incorporate? Or is it just focused on, you know, um, what the, the new location could possibly be as we evaluate all of our options around um, this headquarters building? Um, and so again, it's a very, uh, four bullets, a lot of things on that particular page um, sort of embedded with that. Um, but again, I'll pause again to see if there's any direct uh, director's comments in, on the area of our capital projects. All right, hearing none, then I'll move on to our last slide as it relates to our priorities. And I just wanted to identify a couple other efforts that, um, or items that um, certainly will have an impact to the district here. One, of course, is the 2022 election. Um, uh, we have three divisions that are up for um, that period of time. Um, we are actually able to go on to the LA County website and get an estimate if you will, what those costs are. So this is one of those costs that shows up every other year. So this is again just me making you aware. That current uh, estimate is about six hundred thousand dollars. So you'll see that increased cost, if you will, in the um, uh, in the uh, fiscal year 2023. Um, again, it's a required cost for us to pay our allocated share of that. And so I just want you to be aware of that. Also, too, with the movement forward on the standby charge settlement, as you know. Um, the uh, judge has given us preliminary approval. There has been notice to the class. Um, and uh, so we anticipate, you know, that uh, through that process that will be hopefully um, uh, give final approval um, early part or uh, in the next few months um, that uh, we would then see the um, settlement as discussed um, would be um, in play. And so you'll see, start to see that our standby charge revenues uh, will um, go from $10 million to about $6 million in this first year. Now, what's interesting is that in fiscal year 21-22, we thought that was going to happen in this year. We were going to see that drop. Um, but because of the delays by the court, that, that information, um, while it's been budgeted at six, we are anticipating to be back at our original sort of $10 million. Um, but then again, once the um, final court uh, approval is done, we will then see that drop. And we have been already factoring in, if you will, what that decline looks like over the eight year period um, of that settlement arrangement. The other efforts that you see there, as I already mentioned, is that we do have some agreements that are coming up. The first one coming up is in August, 2023, where the Torrance, uh, both the Torrance uh, refinery agreement for the nitrified and the boiler feed coming up. Uh, so we'll be starting that process uh, working with them. We have been working with them, but we'll continue to work with them to finalize on what a new agreement uh, would look like. And certainly you'll see that um, before you. 
Um, we also um, wanted just to share, and, and it's already been highlighted, um, again, is finding out ways that we can get our grant and local project shares to help us within our programs and our activities. Um, and so we want to um, you know that that's an effort that's underway and certainly can have a financial impact to us. Uh, maybe not a direct cost to us unless there is, you know, like I said, money coming in. Uh, and also, too, once we have this sort of um, better understanding and a fuller understanding of all of our capital projects, um, really addressing the needs of the boards and sort of where, where we are from, you know, a planning perspective, we can really then focus in on the capital funding policy that really would hopefully set the parameters of, around when do we use cash, when do we have external funding, when is that appropriate, um, and really have that um, dialogue with the board. Get a policy in place so that it becomes a, a, a something that we can continue to monitor and and um, and be in a um, in a position that we're you know consistently following. And of course, all of these uh, business decisions that are being made would be incorporated into our long-range financial model. Again, the district uh, staff is already maintaining um, some information here, but as decisions are being made here, certainly we will need to update that information and then provide you not just the five-year forecast, but a longer forecast for you to see sort of what that impact is of the variety of decisions from refinery agreements to settlement agreements to uh, water sales assumptions over not just the five years, but out, out into the future. So that takes me to the end of the budget priority section. Um, and with that, I'll pause once again to see if there's any more feedback that you have um, before I go into the last um, slide. As this chairman of the committee, I want to say you've done a fine job in your presentation. Your department is a number one for so Congratulations. Thank you. Appreciate it. All right. With that, um, let me just take you to the final slides. So a couple, couple more slides, if you would. Um, again, uh, just as I mentioned to you at the beginning of this slide, um, again, I'm always going to end the presentation with a preview of what's coming up. This is the same slide that you previously saw, and it just happens to be that it's on the same presentation. Um, but again, we are going to be focused in on membership and sponsorships, as well as the labor uh, assumptions, as well as staffing um, at our February workshop. And again, at this point, we're scheduled um, or looking to schedule it on February 23rd. Um, date to, uh, time to be determined, but um, that's the scheduled time frame. And with that, I believe that takes me to the end of my presentation. And again, I'll if you have any additional questions or comments. Okay, great. Let us go on to uh, 6C, right, that's a report. Yes, thank you very much, uh, Chairman Deer. As you mentioned, the last item on our information calendar is item 6C. It does begin on packet page 315. It is our monthly financial report. And for this report, we have Marianne Rexrod, our manager of finance. Uh, thank Great. you, Marianne. Hey, Jay, good afternoon. Just, Marianne, if I could, I just wanted to make quick three announcements just uh, so that the board is aware. Um, so I just wanted to share your attention on a couple of items that I think are important um, and sort of timely and just wanted to make you aware of it. One is that um, uh, at the effort of our staff, we were able to get a refund from the city of El Segundo for our UUT, UUT, which is their user utility tax, of about $9,000, um, and that's the refund, and then uh, a no charge going forward. So I just wanted to share that good news story of our staff continuing to ensure that we are paying for what we uh, need to pay, and not more than what was required to pay. The second more important uh, news is that through an effort um, of an application to the California Special District Association, uh, we submitted an application, we received notice, and then actually received funding on January 10th uh, that we received um, COVID-related uh, COVID um, funding, if you will, for special districts. Since they were not part of the original um, sort of funding that was available to uh, from the federal agencies down to, uh, they were down to cities and states, but not down to special districts, uh, there was an effort by our legislature to work with the, uh, the um, the state budget to set aside $100 million, and the district was awarded $2.3 million um, of uh, COVID-related funding. So we wanted to share that good news story with you. And the final announcement I wanted to share with you is that uh, the annual W-2s, 1099s are currently underway. Uh, you will have that information to you by the end of the calendar, um, by the end of the month. 
um, as required by law to provide that to you. So uh, never fear, those W-2s are on your way and, uh, and also to work our, our vendors that are as needed. So I just wanted to share those three announcements with you before Marianne shares her report. Thank you. Okay, there he is. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you, Margaret. Eric, you All right. No, I'm just, thanks for that information. Great news. All right, Mary Ann, please. Thank you, Director Deer, Chairman Deer, um, and good afternoon, members of the board. I'm happy to present on item 6C. I know you've had a long morning and afternoon, so I'll try to keep it brief and I'd be happy to answer any questions uh, along the way. Uh, but I'll, as I said, I'll try to be as brief as possible. Um, so beginning on page 317 of your packet, you will see your demands for the month of December. Just want to point out a couple of things. Uh, total demands were about 21.9 million for the month. And uh, also a couple of items that I think not they're kind of out of the ordinary, I'll say. Um, the first one is shown on page 320. And this was a payment that I think Margaret alluded to with the settlement of the standby charge. We had to provide notification. This was the first payment. You'll see it there as check number 86968, Rastegard versus West Basin. That payment, that first payment, I should say, was made um, in December. The second item I wanted to point out, again, not because it's unusual, but just that there were two. Um, so at the top of page 323, um, the, uh, the monthly payment to Suez, we actually had two payments for the month to cover both the month of October and for November. Again, not unusual, but just wanted to point out that we had two um, due to timing for the month. And I'll pause there to see if there's any other questions or questions I say on the demands before moving on to your cash and investments. Okay, so I will move on to cash investments. This is item 6CB. Um, again, this is the normal report that you see each month. Couple of things to point out. This is your balance, your total market value at the at the point in time, which is December 31st, 2021. Um, your security types are shown in that pie there. Uh, just a note of here I want to make is that uh, did, Margaret did mention we did have some revenues come in for the month of January. They're not shown here, but they'll be shown in January. And the other thing to note that we do have our semi-annual bond payments that are being made in the month of January. They'll quote to, equate to about a total of $6 million. So you may see a drop in your market value and your cash investments for the next month. And the following pages are the... Uh, transactions for the month, the security types, we show you the quality and the uh, duration, and then the following pages will show you the details of your portfolio. And just wanted to be quick, to, um, but see if you do have any questions, I'd be happy to answer those. Okay, if see, hearing none, I will move down to your monthly water sales, which begins on page 332. So this is for the month of December. Um, at the very top is your imported water sales. Um, I think you heard Margaret mention that the December numbers are lower for the fiscal year 21-22, and that's down about 1,200 acre feet from the prior year and about 600 acre feet to budget. Um, we did see a lot of rainfall during the month of December as compared to prior year. In fact, we had more than nine inches of rain and also contributing to that lower sales. I believe we did have cooler weather. Um, on average, our temperature in the month of December was down to about 62 degrees versus last year, which we were around 71 degrees. So both those factors I feel contributed to the lower sales. And also on a year to date basis, just to point out, we're about two and a half percent lower than our budget and we're trending about 2.8 percent lower than the prior year and then moving down to the bottom of that page just want to highlight a couple items is your imported barrier sales um, as you see the trend is continued where the fiscal year 21 22 sales are higher both compared to budget and to actual um, as you know this is a result of the hyperion spill where we're injecting uh, potable water into the West Coast barrier. And so you'll continue to see that, I think, for the next couple months. Um, but again, that's the reason for those high numbers. 
And moving on to the next page, the top of page 333 is your recycled water sales. Um, now, similar story to last month, we had lower sales compared to last year and compared to the budget. Um, primarily, if you scroll down, you'll see that in the chart. The reason for that is because of the barrier, as I mentioned earlier, we're using potable water to inject in the West Coast barrier rather than the recycled water. So you'll see that we had no production in the month of December. And on a year to date basis, we had very low about 228 acre feet of uh, barrier production for the entire fiscal year. Um, that really concludes my my report on recycled water, I'm, I'm sorry, uh, water sales. So I'll stop there to see if there's any questions before we move on. All right, hearing none, uh, we can finish off with the last report here. This is the director's conference and travel expense that's shown there. And then on the following page, you'll see the executive management and staff travel expense. And that's all I have. If there's any questions, I'd be happy to answer. Yes, no, thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, that concludes item six. Uh, members of the board, are we in, uh, is there a closed session plan? KJ. Mr. Chairman, we have no uh, closed session items for you today. KJ. Um, Director's comments. Director Williams, comments? Uh, no, thank you. Other than great reports, and uh, I look forward to the actual uh, workshop. I'm impressed that we have a first class finance, and that's for sure. Mm -hmm. uh, Director Houston, comments? Uh, I would just think. I would just echo what was said. So thank you very much, uh, Margaret and EJ and staff. Thank you. I think Director Gray has left. That ends our close. Our, our I'm, I'm still minutes. here. I'm, I'm still oh, here. Yes, I'm here. <laughs> yeah, I just want to echo what everyone has said about our finance department and everyone else. Great reports today. Thank you very much. Thank you, Director Gray. Uh, Easy if you go for the comment, we're going to adjourn the meeting. This meeting is adjourned. Thank you. Thank you very much.